Good evening. Welcome to the East Bridgewater School Committee meeting of January 14th, 2020. And at this time, I take a motion to open the meeting. So moved. Moved by Teresa. Second by? Second. Um, Tim, all in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to, to the, the flag, flag of the United, United States, States of America, America and to, to the, the Republic for which it stands, one nation, nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Welcome back after our holiday break. It's our first school committee meeting after the break. And um, <clears throat> I know that Superintendent Legault wants to have Dr. Williams go first. So we'll have her go first. So Superintendent, take it away. Dr. Williams? <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate you letting me um, go first. Uh, Mrs. Nichols actually went home ill this afternoon, so she's not with us this evening, but the two of us were going to share just a couple of things under professional development. One is something new um, that we formalized this year under uh, the PD Academy, and that is offering book clubs, online book clubs for staff members. So in your packet, uh, there are the books that are being offered uh, for the remainder of the school year. Uh, continuing with the universal design for learning theme, last year I had shared with you uh, one of the books that we were doing was the culturally responsive design for English learners. Um, Mrs. McPartland, Mrs. Fleming, and Mrs. Fisher all ran book clubs at different points during the year. Mrs. Fisher is continuing with that book. Uh, but then you'll see in your packets that there are four other books that are being offered. Um, three others that are under the Universal Design for Learning, which will be offered by Mrs. Fleming, Mrs. McPartland, Mrs. McGovern, uh, and Ms. Trainer will be offering those books, uh, as well as uh, the book in the bottom left uh, corner, um, which, uh, so you want to talk about race, which will be offered by Mrs. Sheehan and uh, Mrs. Glynn, uh, training they had gone to earlier in the year, uh, that they offered some suggestions of books for faculty training, uh, and this is the one that they were partial to. So um, because it is online, we have opened it up to other districts. Um, so you'll also see in your packet the graph that shows um, at the very back of the packet, it shows all the districts that are participating in our online uh, book clubs. 36% uh, 30 of the population is uh, staff members from our district, but certainly well represented from other districts around the area. So once we had our book club um, guide um, set up and ready to go, I shared it out with our superintendent's network uh, and very thankful that they then shared it with their staff members. Uh, and one of the big draws, I think, for everyone is um, each of the book clubs are 15 hours worth of work. And so by participating in the book clubs, um, some of them will satisfy the requirements for recertification. Staff members need 15 hours under special education, <coughs> and they need 15 hours under English language learners or sheltered English immersion. Um, so certainly a, a great way for them to gain uh, more knowledge, but then also to satisfy uh, their licensure uh, requirements. So uh, I just wanted to include that uh, in the packet tonight so that you could see uh, the guidelines for the book club um, as well as share with you the books that um, a number of our staff members will be um, reading over the course of the year. Uh, the second thing that I wanted to share with you, um, we're going to continue with the model uh, that we've used uh, over the past couple of years on our full day professional development where we have breakout sessions. Uh, we have members of our district that will be offering workshops for staff members, but we also have another, a, a number of other districts that we have partnered with. Uh, and what I mean by partnering, we have sent staff members to their full professional development day trainings to offer workshops, and now um, they'll reciprocate by sending staff members to ours. So we have um, staff members from Foxborough, um, Somerset, um, and um, Medford, um, that, or Medfield, that will be coming to, to join our workshops. And just even next week, we have four of our staff members who will be uh, presenting at workshops in Foxborough for their professional development day. So a free um, opportunity for us to have outside presenters come in, but then certainly an opportunity for our staff members to um, really share what they're learning, 
um, and what they're knowledgeable about with the districts around us. Um, so we will do breakout sessions on our March 3rd, um, but we have, uh, we have added two components that we're really excited about. One is in lieu of keynote uh, speaker at the beginning of the day, we will have passion pitches and those will be by our own staff members. So we have a staff member from Central School, Ms. Tellis, a staff member from Mitchell School, um, Mrs. Cameron, and a staff member from the Junior Senior High School, Mr. Shea, uh, all will be sharing a passion pitch with the entire district. Really their why, why they're in the field of education, uh, what um, drives them and motivates them in their teaching, and uh, what is it that about them that inspires their students. Um, and it really fits with our theme. Our administrative team is reading Start With Why. Um, and it really has changed the conversation for us to really focus on why do we do the things we do? What are our beliefs? Um, and what is it that we want everyone to know about the district as to um, what is our focus? And um, what is it that we're all, the common goal that we're all trying to reach and how we're going to get there? So um, like I said, this is a little bit of a different take, but certainly, hopefully, equally, if not more, uh, inspirational for our staff to hear from their own colleagues uh, about the things that they're doing every day in their classrooms to inspire their students. Um, and if you know any or all of those three staff members, uh, you will know that their enthusiasm is quite infectious. Um, so we're excited for that. Uh, the other new piece that we're bringing is at the end of the day in our fourth session, uh, we feel it's really important we share out our own professional learning with one another, um, but we don't often have time to look at how that is impacting our students. So we're going to have a student showcase. So I've met with each of the principals on Monday. Yes, what's today? Tuesday. Um, yesterday. It feels so long ago. Um, and they will be... Um, talking to staff members about bringing students in for at least one hour of that professional development day to have a student showcase uh, set up in the gymnasium and so that staff members can you know sort of like a science fair approach where they can walk around and uh, learn from their students so uh, an opportunity for students like we talked about at central school even as young as second grade they will take staff members through a morning meeting at this point in the year our second graders have been doing morning meeting for three solid years um, and you know are, are feeling very confident with the components of morning meetings so they will teach um, the, the staff what they get out of morning meeting every day um, at the Mitchell School we're going to focus on our steam um, lab and and mrs. Cameron will have students showing staff members um, the process for some of the things that they're learning and, and doing uh, and creating in the steam lab and then the same with the junior senior. Obviously at the junior senior level, uh, the students are a little bit more comfortable um, communicating um, what they know and, and uh, the hows of their learning. So we're hoping to have a, a larger number of, of junior senior high school students, um, but also sharing out um, some of the things that the, the exciting things that they're learning in their classrooms. Um, we thought maybe to put the focus on uh, the arts in some of the uh, elective classes because we feel like a lot of the professional development that we're doing with staff members are really focused on the core content areas of, of ELA, math, science, and social studies. Um, but certainly Mr. Sylvia will have that conversation with his staff and um, I know just in general conversation with a couple staff members, they're excited for their students to come and, and share and I know that the teachers at the lower levels will love to see where their students are now and, and some of the exciting things that they're learning. So two new components um, that we're going to add to our breakout sessions for March. Thank you. You're welcome. Any questions? Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Doctor. Welcome. Next up, we have Sierra Lonigan for a report from the Student Advisory Council. Hi. So there is only the one general issue that, well, I have a couple of things that I'd like to talk about, but the general issue right now is Chromebooks, <coughs> which I did see that was in the agenda. And so I'd like to, when we get to that point, I'd like to be able to provide a student perspective for that conversation. And then continuing on to club updates. The officers of Unity Club went to Framingham State University State on Monday to hear various speakers and participate in some workshops. They've reported back to the club and are going to use some of the strategies discussed at the event to promote anti-racist and anti-discriminatory values in the school. 
Last week, students in DECA participated in their district's competition in which 10 students placed and will be moving on to their state competition at the end of February. The senior class is hosting a winter ball on February 1st. The junior class has been making a strong profit selling wooden Viking logos with the help of Mr. Ferrioli. The music program has begun advertising for its fifth annual mattress fundraiser. This is going to be held on Saturday, January 25th from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. And finally, the Med Club will be hosting a big sale on Friday. The big sale was Friday and where? During all high school lunches. Oh, okay. Thank you. <clears throat> um, Superintendent? Yep. Thank you. The Central School Boiler Project, a quick update. We have a few things that need to be um, sort of fixed up um, to get done, uh, to get us fully commissioned. The commissioning agent was out. Um, they did go through. There was a couple areas that just needed to be um, so sewn up, uh, buttoned up. Um, inside of the, the chimney, there needed to be um, a sleeve not the architect, but uh, a sleeve put in. And then there was a couple of little things um, at the end that just needed to be sewn up and buttoned up before the entire project is done. But the commissioning agent was out. It was working properly. We did have a few issues, like I said, about a month ago. We have not had those issues since. Uh, we feel that we've um, fixed and corrected those issues um, of the timing or of the adjusting of the temperatures and what time they click on and what time they click off. So um, knock on wood, we haven't had any issues, uh, Mrs. Burns, so we hope that uh, We'll get that commission sooner than later, and uh, we'll go on to our next project. But it's still on time. And it's still on time, on budget. We're under budget. We're still there. That's a good story. I like that. Yes. <laughs> um, the FOBs in the, in, uh, at the Mitchell School um, and the, the new vestibule and the new doors. The doors are there. The, the safety equipment has been put in. The new cameras look terrific. There's a new, uh, even a new monitor in the uh, main office uh, so that the... Um, Mr. Gentile's assistants and secretaries can see what's going on if he's not up in the main office just to make sure that the hallways are clear and safe. Uh, the FOBs are being programmed as we speak and hopefully we'll see those within the next, I don't know, four or five days. Um, and the teachers will have access with the FOBs and so will our administrators and uh, school staff going in and out of the building. Just a quick reminder on that, that was paid for by a grant. Paid for by a grant. From? Uh, state. Uh, state. Uh, safety. Uh, Safety grant. Yeah, that's all I would Security say. Safety yeah. The Chromebook and IT update. This is what I have for you. All right, we do have a classroom uh, who has sent uh, a list of students who currently need to swap out their Chromebooks due to uh, some charging issues, which we will have rectified. Uh, once we get our second shipment of the remaining Chromebooks, we have 70 on order right now. We're just waiting for them. They should be in within any day by probably by tomorrow. I'll say it tonight and they'll be here tomorrow at 9 a.m. Um, the first delivery of the shipment they sent us, uh, 40 back in which we have been using to swap out students with issues and hold on to for map testing. Uh, once our ma map testing has been completed, we'll be distributing those devices to those who are in need. So the map testing that we were doing here um, at this building, those students who needed a Chromebook or needed one just for the map testing, they were using those. Once map testing has been completed, those 40 will now join the general population and go out to those students who need a Chromebook. Um, we have 20 damaged screens. And screens are being damaged for... We have over 40 damaged screens. Yeah. Well, I've got 20 damaged... Right. We've, we've replaced, though. We've got 40 on, but we've got 20 that are replaced. That's what I have. That's from your people. Well, it's, it's <laughs> wrong, then, because there's 40 <laughs> waiting to be replaced right, right. now. So... Um, it says we have replaced a good amount of screens, but a good batch comes in to uh, basically create a wash. So if 20 are out, 20 are coming back in, and 20 and 20. And uh, it's a two-week, John, two-week turnaround time when they're sent out about? Is that what it is? Uh, yeah, it's about a two-week turnaround time to when they're sent out to when they come back. Okay. But it, we, if we have those 70 new ones yeah. coming in, yeah. it should be a little bit quicker. Okay. Uh, well, we, we, have, uh, we have a surplus uh, because you guys allowed us to spend money on... Uh, circuit breaker money um, 
map testing, of course, kids don't have Chrome, mm -hmm. don't use the school Chromebook, so they need the school Chromebook. Right. So yep. we've been giving out our surplus to those kids who, who return them. So we're, we're keeping up. Uh, as I've got two guys. They're keeping up as best they can. I know uh, last uh, last time, Sarah, you, you spoke, and I, I, I mean, we're, we're working hard. We've got a list up there right now of 20 kids who we've called three times to come get a new Chromebook. They don't show up. So, uh, you know. I want, well, let's, let's see here. So on the, the last part I have is that we do have, um, we have some uh, lost chargers. We, we have some screen replacements so that have been damaged. Um, you know, we get it that kids drop them. We get it that, you know, they fall out of your backpack or they fall on the floor or something else. But we also have some, we have some people that may have been careless with them. So they still have to be repaired and we still don't want kids to go without. So I think that, you know, they've got, we've got 70, another shipment of 70 coming in. They should be here by, I would say, they'll probably, I guarantee they're probably sitting on in our dock right now and we'll probably see them in the morning. They'll be here the next couple Is of days. Is that the 70 we don't in addition to the 50 we already mm -hmm. purchased? Yeah. We don't have students who are in need of a Chromebook can't access one there we have if, if we have loaners we, you know, we call we, we kids that we call them three times and we have loaners that go out on a daily basis if a kid does not have but no one's falling behind because they don't have access to a Chrome. right they can come and get one as mr. Shea just said there are kids that have been called down who don't come and pick them up right but they still have access to they it still have access there are kids that have still have a charging issue right that they only work when they when they're plugged in and we know that we know there's a charging issue, but we may not know. That kid may be, my son didn't, couldn't use his Chromebook the other day for map testing because it only works when it's plugged in. I said, well, did you tell anyone? <laughs> yeah. No. He didn't tell anyone. Right, so but to me, to me, that's not an access problem. I mean, they, they, you know, they have to know that it's charging or not charging. I don't think, but, if they, but if he came in and said, hey, this isn't charging, he could get one that would yes. charge. There, 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 are, there are some in surplus now. And we're getting additional this week. Yeah. But Carrie. there is a personal responsibility. I, I completely agree. Carrie, you wanted to weigh in? Yeah. Yeah, with this new information, I'm very happy to hear that they're getting ordered and that they, this problem is getting resolved. I would like to ask one quick question, sure. though. How exactly are they getting called down? Is this by doing an email or is the main office conducting it? Uh, so the IT guys will call down to the main office and the main office would call them down. And it's during the Viking block. From my understanding, Mr. Sylvia? Mostly. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Uh, the first time, first round was done last period. Because uh, so, we had a, a, a large number of students, so we needed a longer time. But those them. kids, students who, if they were broken, and then Mr. Lamont, uh, Mr. If Mr. Kavanaugh or Mr. Lamaki Andrew called down to the main office, it would be through the Viking block. That Always through the Viking down. block. Always through the Viking okay. block. The kids are in a class during Viking block. The office calls the class, says, John Shea, they want to, the tech people want to see you, and John Shea says, never mind, I don't want to go see them. I mean, is that pretty much how it's happening? I, well, they are teenage kids. I get it. If they, <laughs> I have two, so. Yeah. If they don't, but, yeah. yeah. So, but I think that, I think we're getting better at it. Yeah, yeah. Um, and again, we think we need to more, order more than 70. I think we don't, they're, they're not, um, we didn't order 70. They're, they're, they're either went out to get fixed because of screen breaks, so they've got uh, keyboard coming. breaks, or the charging issue. So the, it's not that we ordered 70, we sent 70 out a couple of weeks ago to get Now they're coming. Here. We already got our new ones that we had approved. These are the ones that are in circulation. But they're almost, they're almost late. They look new when they come yeah. back. I think no, John, can I? They're out being refurbished. Have there been any um, reported issues with the new HPs? Because um, I know with the Lenovo, there's the charging issue because the battery disconnects from inside, so that's why they don't hold the charge. But have do you know? Has IT said anything like of consistent like any issues with the new HPs? There haven't been any consistent okay. issues with the HPs. Okay. Good. One thing that I would like to note is how you are conducting the um, the call downs during Viking Block. Is that some kids are not in their classroom during Viking Block? Like for example, I was not in my classroom during Viking Block because I was staying after with the teacher, and so that may not all of them, but it may explain why some kids are not going down during Viking Block. All right. Block. Can I make a suggestion then? Would it, would it be, do you think that going to guidance, could we ask our guidance staff that they should be, they, from what my understanding is they walk around either during homeroom or Viking block to check in with students? 
could they maybe, could technology speak with them so that when they're out, they, because they'll know the student. So if, if they're looking for Ms. Longren in the Viking block and she's not in that class, but all of a sudden she's coming down the hallway and I'm Ms. Moore, I know her, I know she, I know this young woman. Hey, listen, we were looking for you, I, I think. We, we, can, we, can, we can definitely utilize that system. We, when we call a Viking block for a student and they're not in there and they're somewhere where else, they're always checking in with the original Viking block. So we know, they tell us where they are. So we'll okay. call that room usually uh, to get that. Okay. So, and we've been I'm just making really a suggestion that, you know. Yeah, no, it definitely we've is. We've got some people that are out there walking around like you and Mr. Bosch, and I mean, maybe there should be a, a, a list on a daily list coming out when you guys are out walking around so that when we run into a student, we may see them. Maybe even in the uh, cafeteria, put up, a, put up a list on your way in so you can, there might be a, I don't know, maybe up on the, um, the TVs. I was just going to say, what about the screens? What about the TVs that we can we roll can them? Definitely utilize roll the too. names. If, you are, you know, if your name appears, go get your Chromebook at this time. Yeah. But yeah. The, the, one of the issues is we just can't man that area from okay. 7 to 3. So it's got to be, it's either after school or that Viking block, mm -hmm. from my understanding. Yes? How much, did, how much did it cost us to buy 50 Chromebooks? Don't do it all. Uh, well, 200 bucks a yeah, two, they were like 250, weren't they, John? 250. Yeah, so. But I don't. I don't I, think we need, we need more. It doesn't don't sound like right now we need more. If we have actually, what, 100 and. If there's 70 that are coming back from repair and then 40 that will be back in circulation with the MAPS testing. I mean, I don't know numbers-wise, but that seems like a pretty decent cushion. I think we've covered it, yeah. Yeah, I don't think we need more, I think. I mean, because the, the, the students need to, to older Chromebooks ownership of it as well. Well, the, oh, I think the some older Chromebooks will be aging out, and as yeah. they age out, we'll, that's when we'll buy our next mm -hmm. round of HPs, yeah. right? right? Yep. It's not always buying new. It's about fixing the problem that we have in the organization. Right. If, if we're not doing... How to, how to get them out and how to get them back and how to do it more efficiently, then we need to look at ourselves and say, well, how does the organization get better to do this? Just buying more and putting more in circulation doesn't fix the problem, the problem. of the route. So, I, you know, we, we'll stick on it. And, I, and hearing from you continues to make us better at it because I think we're down to, we're, we're honing in on some of these issues. Okay. I just have one final question. Sure. As for deciding which students get their Chromebooks when, is there any sort of priority system to that? Or is it just going by like an alphabetical order or randomly? Uh, just chronological. When the when first, they come in. first in, first, no, there's a listing of when they come in. So we'll just okay. start at the top. So it really sounds like, Ellen, that the, the biggest challenge right now, we fixed the root of the problem. We figured out from the beginning of the school year now yeah. we just need to vet out the communication process so the kids, it works for the students to come get their Chromebooks. That just seems like what, and then we can reassess. Because I don't think based on these numbers we yet need to approve no. more Chromebooks. No, I, th I, think, I think we have enough Chromebooks. We keep t tweaking the process to try to make it easier. Okay. But Sierra, if something comes up tomorrow. Yeah. Email me or st stop by my office. Well, or, or actually, or go, through Sylvia. go through the principal first. Go to the principal. Because <laughs> this is what I'm going to deal with tomorrow. Morning, okay? So do me a favor. Go to Mr. Sylvia, tackle him first, then let it come down to us. Because I, I don't want to wait two weeks to this find out there's a problem. Yeah. So you know, I'd, rather, I'd like to tackle it and try to fix it, and we can work together to try to fix it. I mean, a kid this like, is going to crumble right now. <laughs> it's not necessarily that, well, some kids are, cho are choosing that it's easier to get a Chromebook that's not issued by the school because, um, like, for example, my friend, um, her Chromebook requires that it has to be plugged in all the time for it to work. And she has chosen that instead of rather having to deal with that hassle, she is using a Chromebook that was her friend's sister's. And so it's, it comes from an odd place, but that's what she's had to do to get a working Chromebook and participate in class. Um, some, a lot of students are finding that it's a bit of a hassle to have to sit by a plug every single day in class for them to be able to do their work. Okay. But they don't have to if they reach out. Right, because well, there's 70 new ones will be in yes. tomorrow. And maybe Mr. Sylvia can sit with his, his administrator. <laughs> and, um, do you, you meet with the students? Uh, no. Okay. 
Uh, maybe you could sit and meet, maybe meet with someone that maybe Kiara meet, meet with her and sit down and say, hey, maybe we could try this. Absolutely. And go out and see with the students and see if maybe you can all come up with a, a, a different process. Because I know that we bought um, plugs. I know that we bought extension cords. I know that we bought a lot of these things. If we're not using those because the faculty thinks that they're unsafe or people are going to trip or I don't want to put them out every morning or whatever, we need to make that decision. Because some people wanted the extension cords and some people wanted the plugs, correct? Right. So we went out and bought those and we put them in the classrooms. Now we're hearing that kids don't want to plug their Chromebooks in the whole time. So now we've got to figure out, okay, so we put the cart before the horse once again and that's why I'm saying your organization needs to fix the root of the problem and then come and then make it better. I mean, we don't, we're not going to have all HPs by next year. It's going to take us a little bit longer for that, but it's, it's getting better. So the more you bring it to my attention, the better I can make the organization work. Sounds okay? Good. Yeah. The, the root of the problem is, <laughs> is that some of these Chromebooks have a plug issue, and we're, I'm dealing with our attorney right now to try to figure out if we have, and if there's anything we can do. Thank you. So we started the um, started the school committee budget kickoff this evening at 6:15. Uh, met with the, our school committee uh, team um, subcommittee for budget and working on that. But we've also started with the town administrator um, Brian Noble uh, and our finance committee representatives were here last week when we met. Um, and also uh, Melissa Morrissey, who is the uh, treasurer of the, uh, the, the town. They were, we had a meeting with them today and then we presented that to the subcommittee. So we're moving in a direction, it, we are swimming um, together, which is great. Um, good conversations are being had. Um, we had, um, our principals have sat with us twice now on their needs, bare minimal needs to their wants and we'll move towards that. Um, and we've, we did a, uh, a three to five year uh, personnel plan with our administrators um, and what we would need this year just to make it work for the 2021 school year. Um, those things are in place, but I do want to uh, send this out. This is the budget timeline for the F21. Um, and I think it's just Tim and Tristan that need one. And Kiara needs one. Um, this is, we will be, February 4th will be the public hearing on the F21 proposed budget at 7 p.m. in the auditorium. Uh, I, will I will do the public hearing for the school committee. I'll present the budget for the 2021 school year, um, uh, being supported by John Shea and Dr. Gina Williams. On Tuesday, February 11th, I'll ask you to certify the 2021 proposed school budget here at the, at the meeting um, at 7 p.m. Monday, February 24th, um, the subcommittee, uh, myself, uh, Mr. Shea, will present the F21 budget to the Finance Committee and the Board of Selectmen at 6.30 p.m. Um, at Town Hall. And then on March 2nd, we will, uh, and we'll also present our, our articles that we would like um, to be presented to the town. And then on March 2nd, we'll submit the warrant to the Board of Selectmen, the, the warrant for the Board of Selectmen for the town meeting. So it's a little bit quicker pace than we've ever done before. I feel that we will be on time for this. Um, as you know, we are still in contractual negotiations, so things do pend on that. Um, Mr. Noble is very aware of that at this time, and he's been up, um, he's been kept in the loop. You've been kept in the loop, um, so we're moving towards that. Is the entire committee going to see the proposed budget before? Oh, yes. Okay. Well, the subcommittee hasn't, it hasn't approved it. Right. Uh, so we're not there yet, but you'll see it probably by the end of January. <coughs> Um, I? I did receive a letter of intent to, uh, from Diane Ashey, our Aww. front office um, principal secretary here at the EB's uh, Junior Senior High School. Uh, Mrs. Ashey, um, as you can see in her enclosed material, would like to retire <coughs> June 30th, 2000, uh, 2020. So as much as I didn't want to accept it, I have accepted it. Mm -hmm. um, I know she's ready and wants to spend some time with her family. And um, we wish her all the best of luck, but we'll have her here in the, in the spring. 
couple of things. I want to thank Everett's Auto. Um, had, they have donated a, um, a trailer um, for, um, for our new hidden in plain sight for EB Hope um, for the school to make a bedroom and maybe a bathroom in it. Um, with Mr. Ferrioli and his class, it is out. We did, get, we did get it to be parked out in front of the shop, uh, the wood area, the metal shop, wood shop areas, um, so that Mr. Ferrioli and the students could build um, the rooms that we will be using for um, Hidden in Plain Sight. And I don't know if any of you got to see the trailer that was here that we borrowed from Falmouth um, that was here two months ago um, at our last at our last uh, professional development. Um, if you haven't seen it, we're hoping to have it here in March so that it'd be ready for um, open uh, parent-teacher conferences. Parent -teacher conferences. Um, and we'll have it throughout the district. It'll move around. We'll be able to bring it to the Mitchell School. We'll be able to bring it to the Central School if they would like it so that parents can see it. It's really for parents and community members, grandparents, aunts and uncles, to be able to go into the trailer, to be able to go into a makeshift bedroom, to look around to see where people, um, anyone, could hide paraphernalia. And they actually don't allow kids to go in there. No, they don't. Matter of fact, the students will build the room. Uh, when the room will be set, the students will no longer be able to go into the room. So. Um, but I do want to thank Everett's, Everett's Auto. They, uh, they are very generous. Um, Eight by 27. And they have given us a lot of, um, a lot of help and support. And that was for a community, so I want to thank them for helping us. I, two little things that they're not little; they are very big. And I, I this young woman, um, one of our educators at the Mitchell School, um, along with her counterpart here at the high school, are just doing tremendous things um, with our STEAM program. Tor Victoria Cameron, who is our uh, at the Mitchell School, and then we have Dr. Ozawalski up here uh, running a after-school program for high school girls for STEAM. Um, I don't know if you got to see the local news on Friday, January 10th. Um, we had a full in the Brockton Enterprise called Girl Power. We have an after-school STEAM program. Um, if you haven't been into the STEAM program, um, I know that she has, I know that Tori has opened that room up and you're, you're more than welcome to go at any time. Just call over um, and let Mr. Gentile know so he can let Tori know that you're coming. And, and that goes for anybody who would like to just see what happens in there. It's about activating learning. Um, she's probably one of the best at activating learning, um, and it's tremendous. I know Dr. O has just asked us if they could go to a field trip, and I believe they're going to MIT. I, I haven't seen the whole, and have seen, I did hear Dr. Williams say that, wow, um, Dr. O has sent in a request to take a group of students, um, girls, uh, to um, a professional development day for girls in STEAM. Um, we are very excited about this program because it's hands-on. It's allowing kids to activate prior knowledge and to go and, and really experiment in their own way and how to develop their own learning skills. I think it's great. I'm glad to see that more girls are getting involved in math and science. Um, it's not only for girls, though, but we do have a lot of kids that want to be involved in the program, and they're doing a great, great job. Um, Tori also wrote a book which is going to be public, which is being published right now and it will be online and Dr. Williams um, has purchased a few copies uh, for the professional development team um, and the principals to go through and um, it's about how to get kids involved in, in STEAM and how to uh, games associated with lear learning activities called games um, uh, to get kids involved and activated in this type of learning. And um, she's taken a chance. She wrote a book. It's going to be published. And I hear, from my understanding, through Aaron Fisher, who is the guru of uh, technology <laughs> all over the place now, I, um, Aaron said that it is just terrific. Um, she got to see it, I think, prior to it being published. Um, and people are really going to be excited about it. So, we have asked um, Tori to come um, and meet with you once the book is published, and she will be here at the school committee one night, and we will be able to talk a little she bit. She's going to bring her a new steam cart? She will. <laughs> we do have a new steam cart. I think that um, 
Ms. Burns is going to speak about it um, because it did arrive at the Central School and you did have some bodies with it with Mrs. Fisher, as Ms. Burns said. She'll talk about it when she gets up here. I know that um, Andrew's going to, Mr. Um, Gentile, will speak about it at the Mitchell School. Um, I was there the other day, took some pictures of it. Um, but it's important um, that now we're starting to see, K, when we talk about K through 12, we're starting to see K through 12. Regardless if it was started at the Mitchell, we're starting to see it at the Central now, and we're getting those students involved, and Dr. Rowe has now uh, taken the reins here at the um, Junior Senior High School, and I think we're starting to see a little bit more in here, and I know that um, we are still looking at getting more um, involved. We have some new teachers that are getting uh, involved here at the Junior Senior High School, and I know that in seventh and eighth grade, um, they're doing a lot of that um, the STEAM programming. So it's, it's, um, it's exciting. I'm glad to see that, and um, I hope to continue that. But I think it's, um, it's a credit to uh, Tori and what she's doing down there, too. I mean, I think you had over a couple hundred people there a couple months ago um, just to have a STEAM night. She invited a lot of people. We all went, um, had great stuff going on. A lot of kids, a lot of parents went down. Um, it's important. It's important, and I want her to know that we do enjoy um, being able to see that. So that's really all I have for you right now. I think there's a lot going on. Um, I've been out and about. Uh, the principals are here tonight, so they're going to talk a little bit more about what's going on in the buildings. Okay? Any questions? Any, have you heard anything that I don't know about? Fantastic. And I know Once, and I, I'm going to say this to Kiara, and I would say it to everybody this evening. If, we, if I don't know about it, I can't do anything about it. The principals, I have them tell their staffs this at, at, at their meetings. I say it to all of you, and I say it to everybody at home. If I don't know about something, I can't do anything about it. So if you're sitting on something that you thought somebody knows, and they haven't told me, or it hasn't gotten to our office, we can't do anything about it. If the principals don't know about something, they can't help the teacher or the student do anything about it. So if you're hearing something, you know, it, it's not blase, blase when people say, if you see something, say something. If you see something, call us. Let me know what's going on. I can't help if I don't know. Thank you. Hey, you know, on that note, should we at least mention uh, a, parent in, a parent received a phone call in East Bridgewater today, I believe it was, from uh, someone who said they were calling about SAT testing. And they, they went on and uh, was asking for credit card information, which was not given to them. But it was obviously a scam phone call. So if anyone calls and is asking you for information about your student who, with an SAT, for asking about SAT or whatever, don't give them your credit card information. Don't give them your debit, debit card information. I would hope that you also, if that person did call you, I would hope that you said you, that you called the East Bridgewater Police Department and let the police department know that someone is doing that in our area. And so that they can maybe try something. That person should call the East Bridgewater Police Department. I mean, we can put it out there. There's really, I, I can Right, and I, they're good about putting it out. Yeah, they are. Too. They're very, very good about that. We'll put it, I'll have, uh, we'll put it up on Facebook tomorrow. Um, but on our Facebook page, uh, Mrs. Spenner, but. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> next up, we have Mrs. Kate Byrne. Central School Principal, welcome. Good evening and Happy New Year to everyone. Nice to see you tonight. I'm gonna to start off and just really talk about how we've started the new year at Central School. And believe it or not, January is a very busy month um, in our building. Uh, it's similar to the end of the school year as far <laughs> as its activity. So starting in uh, January, we always start our January off with our preschool registration. So we currently have open enrollment for our preschool programming for the 2020-2021 school year. Um, I will say that this year, our full day programs for our five day full day and three day full day filled up faster than usual. Um, we do, we are collecting names for a waiting list. If I have enough registered um, students, we will open up another session, whether it be a three day full day or a five day full day program. Um, and just a reminder that in our preschool structure, our full day programs and our tuition-based programs 
the tuition funds are used to pay teacher salaries. So I need to have enough enrollment in order to fund a full-time teacher, that teaching assistant, and open <coughs> that class. So by all means, if we have the interest, we will look to do that. Um, but I do encourage people to please continue to apply and register. Uh, our half-day program is where preschool really begins, especially for our students that age into our program from early intervention. So I am looking, actively looking for half-day model students that are either three years of age by the end of August and or four years of age to be able to operate our half-day programs. And those run on the Monday, Wednesday, Friday, or the Tuesday, Thursday, AM and PM sessions. So if you know of people who are interested, please encourage them to come by Central School or check out the website. They can download the registration packet and materials there. Um, but it's been an exciting start to the year as far as our registrations. We do have, um, like I said, many of our programs um, almost reaching uh, capacity. So again, we will open new sessions if indeed we have enough enrollment to do so. So we're happy with the response. We're glad the community likes our program. Um, so hopefully we'll be able to offer more opportunity. Also starting in January, we had our introduction back to school. Also, January starts our after school activities for the winter. So I'd like to thank Lisa Barrasso for arranging that with the faculty and staff. That starts, uh, started this week on Tuesdays and Thursday afternoons from 3.30 to 4.30. Um, and so the students are excited. It was a great first day today for the students that participated. We also have our box program that runs on Tuesday, Thursday mornings. That also began last week. Uh, that's building our kids success program. Many of you are familiar and I'd like to thank Mrs. Hughes. She has coordinated that program this year um, and the students enjoy it. The parents enjoy it. Um, it's a great way for students to be active before they start their school day um, and helps them get on that just right engine to make a great start to their morning meeting. Also this, uh, Janu this January is our next One Central book. So it's our second term and we are still on the district-wide theme of responsibility. So I do have a copy that I'll be happy to leave for all of you. Our uh, term two book is called The Mitten by Jan Brett. I'd also like to thank the PTO. The PTO purchased copies of this soft, uh, the paperback book for all of the Central School students um, with much of their fundraised money. So the students received that book uh, last week and we will now um, have activities connected to um, art, literacy, and STEAM education associated with the mitten now through February. We'll also be integrating it into the special areas. Carrie Trumbull, the library media specialist, she is actually gonna do a Jan Brett study, so it's gonna be an author's study. So she's going to be introducing the students to other books by the same author over the course of the next two months. So we're looking forward to that. As was already mentioned, it is MAP season, so it's our winter um, assessment time. So MAPS, the window did open up last week. We'll continue through January 24th for students at Central School. Uh, in addition, during this time frame, it's also our opportunity to recapture our mid-year data in regards to Dibbles assessments and phonics screeners. And we use that information to then inform our instruction and also create our Title I reading groups. So we'll be looking to create new groups by the end of January. Using that same data that we get from all these assessments then leads into uh, the data and vision meetings that I have with staff once we've been able to now compare fall data to our winter data and really talk about student growth and achievement, what trends do we notice within a classroom, um, what might be working really well, and maybe some areas that maybe we need to rethink, whether it's instructionally or even student specific. So those also happen in the month of January. Formative assessments for all of our non-professional staff is our opportunity that will also take place before February 1st uh, to be able to touch base with all non-professional status teachers about their SMART goals for the year, their progress toward attaining those SMART goals, and have an opportunity to touch base and see what kind of support do they need. Are they on track to meet their goals? And also talk about um, evidence that they should be accumulating and what we see in their performance that helps us rate them by the end of the year based on the educator rubric. So all uh, non-professional status teachers will have those meetings during the month of January prior to February 1st. So that is also underway. I'm happy to mention that you've probably heard about the social studies pilots that are happening this year um, around the district. So our staff, they were able to have last week their second um, day of training in the social studies pilots. At Central School, we are piloting a McGraw-Hill program as well as a Houghton Mifflin program. So day two of training was last week. 
Uh, teachers were really happy to have it, and now that leads um, our staff an opportunity on the half-day professional development day to reflect and talk about what they're seeing within those programs, kind of do some comparison work, and also see how they can now um, cater their instruction from the beginning of the year with the pilot materials. So we're looking forward to that outcome, but I think, you know, they're happy to have day two of the training. There's a lot of materials with new programs, and trying to navigate all that they provide you with um, takes a lot of time. So it's great to have all these resources, but to really make it meaningful, you need someone to guide you in the right direction um, versus the, the hours and hours that it takes to actually navigate the program independently. So we were happy to be able to offer that, and I thank Jen McPartland for able, she arranged that for the staff. I would also like to mention the STEAM cards, yes, that um, Superintendent Legault had mentioned. Actually, Tori Cameron and Erin Fisher came to my staff meeting, actually, last week and presented the STEAM card, all of its offerings, and um, Mrs. Cameron, that has already been mentioned, is just a, a dynamo. Um, she's very energetic, very passionate about what she does, and so excited to be able to bring all technology, low tech to high tech, um, to students' fingertips. So we're excited about the card, um, the card that she has created with funds and support from Mr. Gentile um, and Mrs. Fisher that they're going to be able to bring to Central School. So my staff is already happily fighting over opportunity to have that STEAM cart come to their grade level and how they can best utilize it. What I did share with um, Superintendent Legault was the best, the bonus is that many of those features involve Mrs. Fisher needing to come and also be part of that. So it's great to have one more teacher on board to really make that meaningful for students. But uh, the staff is very excited to see all that um, Mrs. Cameron has thought about in adding to that STEAM cart. Um, so we look forward to using that over the course of the year and perhaps even maybe uh, reaching out to Mrs. Cameron, which I'm sure this is going to be a very successful model, about how maybe perhaps maybe my PTO can help fund potentially a STEAM card that just stays at Central School, um, where this one will be going back and forth because there's only one STEAM card at this time. Um, but it's a, a wonderful idea, so we're looking forward to that collaboration with Mrs. Cameron and Mrs. Fisher. Also during the month of January, this is an opportunity for staff. We provide them opportunity to do what we call vertical and horizontal visits. I may have mentioned those before, but it's an opportunity where teachers get to go and see one another. So, for example, in years past, we might have catered the opportunities for certain teachers to say, well, if you're teaching in first grade, I want you to go see a kindergarten teacher. So you can see what the expectations are in kindergarten, so you have an idea of what those students are learning prior to coming to you. And if you're also a first grade teacher, I really might want you to go to second grade to see what the expectations are when they leave you. And so now, uh, this year, the focus was really teacher driven and I wanted them to say what did they want to learn more about instructionally um, was it content based and not teacher specific but really what they wanted to be able to get out of that experience and then we were catering their opportunities to visit either it could be somebody at your same grade level because that was feedback to say I would really like to see a fellow second grade teacher um, teach uh, science lesson. Great, we can we can provide that opportunity for you. I would really like to see what a morning meeting looks like when they're in kindergarten. Wonderful, we can also provide that opportunity for you. So um, that's been going on throughout the month of January, providing teachers with different opportunity to go out and learn from each other, but also it's really about reflecting to say what am I seeing and noticing and what can I bring back to my classroom or my teaching based on what I'm seeing, either with students and or maybe ideas this teacher has that I didn't think about. So that's also happening over the course of this month. Next, on January 22nd, next Wednesday, is our um, PLC meeting of the month. And the focus of our PLC meeting, I'm working with our Inclusive Practice Academy team from Central School to cater that focus to be strictly about universal design for learning, but helping make connections with staff about when we utilize um, universal design for learning the positive byproducts of that. Talking about when we universally design our classroom environment or our instruction, that we are increasing engagement, that we're increasing student voice and choice, and when we're doing all of those things, we're the healthy byproduct, you're minimizing off-task behavior. So sometimes when teachers um, are challenged with trying to either meet the needs of students or think that, well, you know, managing my class, I'm not sure if I can handle um, so many centers or so many choices. But the reality is when you uni universally design, you increase engagement. So you naturally 
minimize those other types of off-task behaviors. So our goal is to help teachers connect those dots, to rethink the design of their classroom, and offer more choice and autonomy in their daily instruction for their students at Central School. So we're looking forward to that, and that will be on the 22nd. Um, our follow-up planning meeting with that team is actually tomorrow after school. Um, so we're looking forward to that. I mentioned previously, previously to you um, that we are a Bridgewater State uh, Professional Development School. Part of that opportunity, I've mentioned to you, this college professors come with their college students and they come to central school classrooms. So their students have an opportunity to learn from our teachers, but then also an opportunity to practice lessons and instruction with our students. I'm really excited to share that moving forward, I met with Dean Hoffman and uh, Dean Emmons last week. We are going to be incorporating our UDL principles in that collaboration. So we came up with a tool that we've agreed on that they will start introducing into their methods courses with their college students as well as having that language with their professors so that we're all talking the same language moving forward. So that's really exciting and I have a little um, chart that I'd be happy to share and leave with you as well that just outlines the basics. So we found a tool that it's simple and clear enough that a freshman going into college can understand the principles as well as the college professor, the teachers here at Central School, and it really talks about multiple means of engagement, representation, and action and expression. What does that look like? And it's in your instruction, it's in your routines. Um, so it's a great platform and we're really excited to start utilizing this language together in our partnership moving forward. And it, I had very positive feedback from Bridgewater State as well um, and excited about moving for more UDL purposeful language um, and changing maybe mindset even too of um, some of the professors about maybe updating practices in the, correlate and align with the um, inclusive practices and universal design for learning. So it's, uh, I'm looking forward to the opportunity. I think it's going to be a great partnership. We've enjoyed the work that we've done with them the last five years. So I think this is just a way to help keep us learning together because that's the reality. They know we're not experts yet in universal design for learning. Um, so it's a great opportunity for us all to kind of grow in um, the principles. The end of the month, I've got to the last day of the month, um, our PTO fundraiser is on Friday, January 31st. It's our Boosters on Glow Run. It's the really one fundraiser that um, Central School PTO does. So that big fun event that I'm sure you've heard about, and I know Mitchell School also participates in one, typically later in the springtime, but that fundraiser will be on January 31st. Our rally day kickoff starts on the 22nd, and the students will, um, participate in character lessons and videos that are part of the platform through Boosterthon, and they're all based on great character skills like honesty, integrity, um, and not that reliability is listed, but our theme on reliability also fits well into um, building character. So in a nutshell, that is what February looks like at Central School. That's it? That's yeah. it. <laughs> well, that's that's you got January, you. right? Did I say February? I'm already skipping ahead. That's okay. But that's January. Any that's questions? what's going on in January. I'm that is January. Be <laughs> that's January. Thank any, you. any questions? It sounds like a lot going on. It's a very busy You're month. We're always busy. Kate. It's a very busy month. And I will leave uh, these items for you, okay? The book, and I'd love you to see just the UDL platform. Yeah, I'd love to see hey, that. I think that's a, I think that's a great idea with, with Bridgewater State. Uh, I'm glad that you and Dr. Williams have yes. got them over here, got them into the practice school, but giving them the UDL and what you guys are working on at the UDL, um, the PD language, that's a great idea. And Bridgewater State should be involved in that just as well. Absolutely. They were very excited, and it's, um, we're thinking of outside-the-box ways of trying to integrate this in. Um, so I'm excited about it. Good. Thank you. Thanks. I'm excited about the Amber. Yes, I know. Wonderful. You know she's local, right? Where is she? I guess I'd have to look that up. Uh, I don't know whether she's Rhode Island or Western Mass. She's a big chicken person, believe it or not. We're, we've met her at Chicken Joe's. Oh, Veronica right. and I, and she <laughs> donates for, uh, artwork. Well, and now you're awards with the, for Ukrainian folktale. I have the mitten. I'm sure I've you've read that book. It's a classic. So I've read all our books. It's a classic. <laughs> well, the, excellent update. Welcome, Mr. Gentile. You're up next. Thank you. <laughs> she's a chicken person. That's a tough. 
tough, tough act to follow. It always is. <laughs> uh, Happy New Year, everybody. Happy New Year, Andrew. Uh, nice to see everyone. Uh, just a couple of things. Uh, first, to follow up on something that we talked about the last time I was here, uh, there was a discussion about uh, renaming the main office or naming the main office in honor of uh, Mrs. Carol Power. Uh, at that time, we had a discussion about getting a bench uh, to be utilized for that purpose uh, with the help of the superintendent and the Southeastern School District. Uh, they have donated a really nice bench to the Mitchell School brand new that uh, was built there. Um, it's at the building now. Um, the bench itself is gonna just be uh, stained uh, and a plaque to be placed on the bench in honor of Mrs. Power has been ordered. Uh, so when that project is complete, I'll be back to inform the committee uh, and certainly we'll you know, welcome everyone and uh, coming over to, to check it out, so. You know when, oh, you probably don't know when it will be, but I'm pretty sure at least some family members might like to attend. Yep, I'm definitely gonna be reaching out to the family as well. I uh, just wanna make sure uh, we literally just ordered the plaque because we just got the bench, uh, it was either last week or the week before. Um, so just trying to get all the plans in place, make sure it's ready to go. Uh, we'll make sure before it's sort of unveiled everyone that should be as notified. I just wanted to update you on that. Just real quick, we're gonna do something on social media or like through the Brockton Enterprise to make sure that it gets out there too. I, I think it was, it was a really nice idea. Yeah, absolutely. We'll do it in any way that we can promote that, we certainly will. Okay. I would wanna do that uh, in honor of Mrs. Power, who I worked with and uh, was, a, was a great person, as I had mentioned when I spoke about her last time. Uh, just to follow up on, on one other thing that came up earlier uh, with regard to the IT department and the Chromebooks, I do just want to, I, I feel compelled to give a shout out to uh, Josh Cavanaugh, Andrew Lamacchia, and John Shea. Um, with regard to my building uh, alone, every day they're managing and we're utilizing about 675 Chromebooks. Um, somewhere in the range of 50 smart boards. Um, I would say somewhere between 75 and 100 telephones, which are all part of their responsibility. And when any of those things go down, for me personally, I have one of those three guys to go to. Um, what I can say is, if it isn't something that they can fix in that moment, um, they are always responsive. Um, they're realistic with me in terms of if there is going to be a timeline, I know what that looks like. And I always tell them, you know, tell me worst case scenario and surprise me by getting it back sooner. Um, but they're great about it. They keep me informed. And I, and I think similar uh, to what the superintendent said, you know, um, if we know about a problem, we're going to communicate that to the people that can, can help us with it. And I will say for a department of two guys um, under the supervision of Mr. Shea, um, they are doing a great job and, and all I would do, you know, all I would like to do is just to advocate um, for the committee um, to, you know, take a look at the potential to, you know, add to that particular area of the, uh, of the district because they're working hard and they do a great job. I mean, they are two extraordinarily capable guys that work hard every day. Um, but from my perspective, they need more help. That perspective is appreciated and helpful because I don't think we always think. Sometimes we think about, okay, there's this issue here at the high school, knowing that, you know, they support the whole district, but we don't stop to quantify really where the resources are going. So thank you. That, I know in my mind that's very helpful. Absolutely. Um, also, just uh, following up on the superintendent's comments about the steam cart, um, you know, Mrs. Cameron, Mrs. Fisher, I feel like we talk about them every time, but it's, it's deserved. Um, they're doing great things. And, and what I think is great about the steam card in particular is they're taking what they do and love and trying to share that with others and get that out into other spaces and places, both within the Mitchell School and, and obviously uh, at Central as well. So um, it, it's just a great opportunity. Um, you know, steam again is just a, a real great chance for our students to take the skills that they learn in isolation uh, and really apply those uh, to everyday problems. Um, so 
it, it's going great. It continues to progress. The article in the newspaper was fan just another fantastic uh, opportunity to showcase what's going on in EB. Um, so great job to those staff members and, and to those staff members also that are willing to have them come in and try something different. I've been working recently with Karen Clifford, um, the guidance department head, um, on a student internship program for our 11th and 12th grade students at the junior senior high school that are in, a, uh, in, in an internship class and have an interest potentially in going into education down the road. Uh, we are working on putting together a program for those students to work with some of our fifth graders. The reason why we've chosen fifth grade uh, is based on the high school schedule and those students' availability and the way our schedule aligns, that having them work with our fifth graders at least initially is an opportunity for them uh, to work with those students during our intervention block. Um, and students will be paired with classrooms based on availability and a number of other factors um, to go in and work with teachers and students and get an opportunity to see what it's like to work in a classroom. Um, and just to get some more experience for those students that are interested in it. So just in the initial stages, uh, Mrs. Clifford and I met. She um, developed an application for the students uh, that we looked at the other day and uh, working on a few logistical details, but looking forward to that program moving forward. Um, last week, we had the MARC program from Bridgewater State University in at the Mitchell School. MARC is the Massachusetts Aggression Reduction Center, um, which was founded by Dr. Englander uh, of BSU. Um, basically, they are a, an organization that does free presentations to school districts for students. Uh, we've had them out before and uh, felt that it was a good time to bring them back again. Uh, the focus of the presentation was bullying and cyberbullying. Um, what bullying is, what it is not, um, what you should do if you are a witness to or a, uh, a victim of bullying, so on and so forth. Um, the presentation was very good, uh, presented our students with some uh, real clear information, consistent information, so I feel that, that they all have a, um, uh, a good solid foundation uh, when we talk about bullying and, uh, you know, we'll be continuing to have those discussions in classrooms and uh, throughout the school year and moving forward as well, but uh, appreciate the opportunity to have brought the MARC program in. This week, uh, I've been meeting with students to review the ALICE um, school safety protocols. Uh, a letter went out to students, in the dis students and parents in the district recently uh, about the ALICE uh, protocols and that the district is moving ahead with continuing our um, uh, drills and things of that nature. As far as the Mitchell School goes, I am personally doing a presentation with each grade level, one grade at a time, um, just taking them through the basics of what is ALICE, what does the acronym stand for. Um, I've been reviewing with them uh, if we evacuate the building, where our rally points are. Um, the next phase of that, our classroom teachers will be continuing the discussions with students. They will be talking through some scenarios with students in the classroom. So I'll be presenting uh, teachers with three scenarios. They will just have classroom discussions about those scenarios and how they might respond uh, if those came about. And then the sort of the final phase for this month with respect to training at Mitchell, the last week, uh, the week of the 27th, I think it is, uh, we'll be doing a school-wide drill during that time. I'll come on to the announcements. Uh, I will make it extraordinarily clear that it is a drill. As I'm going through my presentations this week with students, we're talking about this as well. Um, I will make it very clear that it's a drill. Uh, I will then announce a scenario um, to the building and students and teachers will basically, in the minute following my announcement, they will have a classroom discussion about the scenario and what they would do as a classroom in that moment if that scenario were actually taking place. They won't evacuate, they won't barricade the door or anything of that nature, but they will decide based on the situation, how would we respond and they'll talk that through. So we try to take a progressive approach to exposing students to these situations and I, as I said to them this morning and, and yesterday when I had my first two presentations, you know, this is like a fire drill. You know, we, we plan for things that are unexpected. You know, I don't think that anything would ever happen, 
but I, I, I want to be prepared. And the example I gave to the kids was, I don't think a fire is going to happen at the building either. But we always do that. And a few years ago, we had a fire at the Mitchell School. And it was in what I would consider to be one of the most unexpected places for there ever to be a fire. It would, the, one of the water bubblers caught fire. That's where it happened. But we had practiced fire drills. And students knew what to do, and teachers knew how to lead them. And in that instance, everyone responded appropriately. So I don't expect that we're ever going to have to use the ALICE protocols, but God forbid that we should. I want to know that I've done the best that I can to, to prepare teachers and students to be able to respond to those situations. So it's not necessarily pleasant. Um, and for some students, I understand that, it's, um, that it can be anxiety provoking. Uh, however, personally, again, um, I feel very compelled to do everything I can to make sure that the students are safe, and this is an important piece of that. So I uh, would encourage any, any parents that have any questions about the, um, about the ALICE training to, to please reach out and be happy to talk more with you about it. Um, that's all I have for this evening. Um, happy to answer any questions, but again, Happy New Year, everybody, and thank you for uh, having me tonight. Thank you. Andrew. Sure. Andrew, uh, one question. How are the kids accepting the, the conversation so far on Alice? Great. Um, you know, honestly, um, they're familiar with it. You know, today I was with the third graders. So I said, how many of you remember talking about Alice at the Central School? If you remember that, give me a thumbs up. And I'm pretty sure every student, except maybe somebody who had moved in from out of town, um, was familiar with it. So that was comforting to me because I knew although we may be taking it to um, a, a different level on some, to some degree, um, I knew they were familiar with it. I know the diligence with which Mrs. Byrne approaches these type of things with her students, so I knew that they were going to be prepared. Um, the fourth graders had kind of heard it from me last year. It was a very similar presentation. The thing that's tough is, is a lot of what if questions. Um, and I forgot that yesterday, so I started to get them, so I preempted it today and just said, you know, we could sit here and do what ifs all afternoon. And I would encourage you to have those conversations in your classroom, because that's where the what if is really going to be more in play. Um, but I said the, most thing, the thing that's most important is listen if we make an announcement, listen to your teachers, and ultimately do what you think is safe based on the information. Because one of the big pieces of Alice is we're being very clear about what's going on. Back in, I remember when we first were trained in, in things, it was like, you know, code red, there is a, a fox in the building. And everybody was like, what? Um, now it's very clear. And that's why I really encourage the kids, you know, whether it's morning announcements or if the, the loudspeaker comes on in the middle of the day, um, whatever it is, Listen, you know, we don't interrupt school a lot to make an announcement. We, we really don't. Um, so for parents at home, please just encourage your kids to listen if something does get announced because um, that's going to be the, the best option is to hear what's going on and be able to make a good decision. But to answer your question, the kids are doing great. And Andrew, we, um, we had the same book that Kate was using for second grade. Yes. Uh, third and fourth grade teachers are both, uh, both have those books in their classrooms. Um, um, Just to clarify, we did not use okay. the book that came with the program at our early level. Right. It was oh, better yep. suited for okay. Okay. our third grade. Elementary. Yep. Our third and fourth grade classrooms all have the, the book. And if they haven't already, at some point, we'll be sharing that with the students. The students that are current, th uh, excuse me, current fourth graders um, were exposed to that one in third grade. Um, so that one will be made available to our fourth graders, but it may not be directly taught as it was last year. Yep. Well, I just wanted to, to clarify if you wanted. At Central School, I don't know if you recall, because I know it was last <coughs> year when we talked about the instructional rollout, we based ours on the Three Little Pigs. So everybody reads that piece of literature first, and then we created as leadership team a social story that talks about how Alice helped the three little pigs. So we relate it back to the context of that story in a developmentally appropriate way, but talk about the acronym in the language of the social story we created. And that's something 
that we rolled out at the beginning of the year with our safety drills. And when I reference the diligence with which Mrs. Byrne does things, that's a perfect example. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you all. Have a good night. I just want to say uh, two things real quick. There was a spirited discussion with the McLaughlin brothers at dinner tonight over the Alice conversations. And um, I listened really, really carefully um, to what they were reporting back because I wanted to see if they understood why, you know, like just if they could really convey to us like the, the, the value and the, the weight of what it was they were learning. And they absolutely understood why it was so important. But the other nice thing to see was that there was no fear in them as they were talking about this. There was no, I'm scared. There was no what ifs. It was, these are things that could happen and here's what we're going to do to respond to it. And I was really happy to hear that because it is very easy for them to get on the path of fear when talking about this. Absolutely. Um, the other thing I just want to bring up real quick before you leave is, um, I was at the Christmas, I know I said, said this to you earlier, I was at the Christmas concert. Um, I was blown away with your staff and, and how that was set up, the performance of the kids. That was fun. The, you were, were you there? I, I saw you. Um, the, the, the engagement with the parents. I thought, um, you know, she has such a large group um, that breaking them up into instrument groups and engaging with the, the, the parents was, was fantastic. Um, my mother drove two hours down to watch it and was raving about um, what a great time she had going that night. So thank you to your staff. Absolutely. That's great. Uh, Mrs. Landers and Mrs. Anderson, uh, our music, uh, Chorus and band teachers, outstanding. Performance was great, very unique, um, and it seemed like everybody enjoyed it. It was a great showcase for the kids, but thanks for the feedback. Yep. Thank you. Thanks, Andrew. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, toughest part of the job is following my colleagues here. It's not easy. They do such a great job. Um, Happy New Year. Uh, again, thank you very much for having me. A couple of updates. Uh, probably the most important update for, for the community out there is uh, we are in the throes of uh, semester classes, final exams this week. Um, our grades, our term ends on uh, Friday, uh, which means we are getting close to our report card posting time, which will be uh, Friday, January 4, 24th at 2 p.m. So uh, for everyone out there, report cards will be posted and made uh, available to the public on uh, next Friday, the 24th, uh, at 2 p.m. When does the school brains shut down? On school brains will uh, open, f uh, the portal will open for the teachers, so it'll shut down on Friday uh, so they can start um, uploading their grades, finalizing their grades. So. Um, Couple updates. Uh, last time I was here, uh, I mentioned our uh, NEASNC um, two-year report. Uh, I have some uh, an update here. I do have uh, a form that I will leave for you. Uh, we talked about the vision of the graduate. Um, we came up with uh, based on the district values as well as our school uh, values um, the four critical pieces to our. Uh, uh, an East Bridgewater graduate would be an effective communicator and collaborator, uh, a creative uh, and critical thinker, an independent lifelong learner, and a responsible engaged citizen. Uh, those are the four um, foundations that we established our vision of our East Bridgewater graduate. And we also have some caveats in there. Um, a couple, of, we actually, we've been, we have a, a committee of about seven teachers, uh, staff members that um, a couple of them keep coming back with more uh, definitions of what those fu fundamentals are. So uh, we're, we're trying to s go with it and uh, we're going to put it to a vote to the stakeholders, which are our, our staff members. Um, and on the flip side, great conversation we had uh, at our first meeting uh, for the, this two-year committee um, was how do we assess it? How do we assess that we are providing um, those skills for our graduate? Um, so we are going to try and pilot a, an assessment. Um, we still have some, we're in the planning stages of it. Um, but it's very similar to uh, the elementary and middle school model report card. Um, we have the four skills, and uh, the scores will be exemplary, proficient, emerging, and not yet. We're trying to wordsmith that a little bit. Um, and we'd like to have every staff member um, do an assessment on each one of their students in their classes. We compile the data. We like to start a portfolio system for all our students. So over the course of four years, 
they could have anywhere between 8 to 16 of these assessments. The goal is to build towards um, uh, uh, what our vision is of the East Bridgewater graduate. Uh, so um, again, this is in the planning stages. We just started this, working on this now. This is going to be part of our uh, two-year uh, progress report, um, which um, when I reached out to uh, several schools locally who have gone through the process, um, this is something they're also working on. So it's a lot of um, borrowing from, from other districts, uh, including some districts from Rhode Island. Uh, Lincoln, Rhode Island is an exemplary school, so we, we really looked at what they did and uh, how they um, entrench the within the culture the vision of graduate, everything they do. Uh, and we really want to use them as a, as a model and exemplar uh, for us uh, to build upon. So. Um, that's where we are. Uh, we are definitely on track for the March 1st um, deadline. Um, and uh, the goal is to have everything completed by the February winter vacation. Uh, and then I will spend that vacation week probably typing in the, the report to the portal for, for the NES, NEAS and C. Um, program of studies update. We are in the final stages of uh, finalizing the program of studies. I've been working with Dr. Williams and uh, Mrs. Clifford. Uh, also with the lead teachers on some of the new proposed uh, courses, uh, which there weren't many, but some of them are very interesting, whether we're going to utilize them as half-year semester courses or full-year um, core courses. Uh, the, one of the things that, that both Dr. Williams and uh, Mrs. Clifford realized is, is we're really sporadic with the pathway for students from freshman year to sophomore year to junior year to senior year. And, and one of the things that we feel is a lot of students have doubled up in the past. Uh, and by the time they get to the second semester junior year or by the time they get to the senior year, only the core courses are left. So they have, do they take those classes again? Do we establish independent studies? So we are trying to set a better pathway, um, more towards a very similar to a, a collegiate model where the first two years are more core courseless. So ninth and 10th grade, there's not a, mo a lot of decision making. Um, you know, ninth grade will we'll establish levels, which will be based on teacher recommendations from uh, our junior high teachers. Um, and then by the time they reach, it gives opportunities, more opportunities for juniors and seniors uh, to have uh, courses available to them. Um, so it will help alleviate some of those stagnant classes that, that, that students have taken and they don't really want to take something, but that's what's left. So we're trying to give them more opportunities. Uh, so uh, we're in the process of that. Um, it looks like we're going to go to print uh, the end of January, and they will be available in February. And our goal, it's tentatively set right now, but our course selections will begin the week of March 23rd for students. Uh, we are going to put a caveat uh, on the, some of the, the elective classes that if we don't have a certain um, number, bottom number, we probably won't run those courses. So we were looking at 15 as, as a, a good size class. Uh, and if it doesn't hit that 15 mark, we probably will have to call those students in and say, listen, choice number one didn't work because there weren't enough signups, but how about picking something else? Um, we're encouraging all teachers to promote within their departments, promote their electives, promote their classes. Um, so we're looking at that, and, and I think we're going to get a better handle on, on the pathway to, for a graduate uh, as far as the core classes specifically. Um, you know, we're trying to enhance the core classes for the underclassmen, the ninth and 10th graders, because it, it would make more sense. Jeff, can I? Yeah, absolutely. As you're looking at those pathways and trying to structure it more collegiately, um, how it, or is there thought being given to making sure that the the kids are engaged? I know some kids tend to double up because they want to be more challenged, or um, you know how how is that being worked into that? Well, I think as far as the the engagement part of it is, we encourage uh, my administrative team encourages engagement in all classes. Uh, so as far as um, it's a long block, 77 minutes. It's very you know, difficult for a student to sit there for seven, seven, 77 minutes. Um, most of the visits, uh, the drop-ins that I do, a lot of the, the classes are engaging. Um, there's very li limited uh, stagnation of the students. So 
I think what we're going to try to do is we're going to really focus on on professional development for staffing to continue to enhance the universal design of learning choices for students uh, to incorporate them within the um, their lesson plans. So the universal design is is that piece that mm -hmm. will continue to pr present the challenge so that the kids can perhaps if they want to be you know it's it's of subject matter interest to them and they want to be more challenged universal design will continue to incorporate that correct correct because ultimately everyone's the goal is the same it's just the pathway might be different to get to it That's so um, you know we myself and mr. Bosch have really encouraged our, our teachers in the evaluation process to utilize the UDL model as their professional practice goal uh, to develop lesson plans using UDL uh, and I would say almost over half of our staff have, have done that this year. And thanks to the UDL team, which they created over the course of last year in the summer, they created some model um, or exemplars of, of some of those SMART goals. So that's where we're at as far as the scheduling goes. So fingers crossed that that, that will hold true, which I think it will because I, I, we're, at this point we're ahead of the game in that. Um, and then once students make their selections, we're going to run the numbers and then establish the course sections and periods and things like that. So uh, ultimately the goal is to have that skeletal um, schedule for all students at the end of the school year. And then once it's um, made public, School Brains makes it public in you know, beginning of August with courses, periods, uh, teacher names, things like that. So uh, that is still a plan. Um, I d over the weekend I spent quite a bit of time, uh, my uh, not without the Patriots playing, so I just had a lot of time to, to, to work on a, an attendance analysis for the school year, uh, which um, Superintendent Legault asked about attendance, um, and it's, it is my crusade, and it, it's, it's not just my crusade, it's also a state mandate. Um, you know, 90% are better for all schools, and, and it's something that is driving uh, our leveling for schools through the state. So I spent the weekend tr working on um, an analysis of each grade broken down, um, happy to say that um, the average daily atten t attendance is, is almost 95% uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, which um, it that's was... How many grades? Uh, that's all six grades, seven through 12. Um, but then I broke them down by grade. Uh, so for example, seventh grade, there are 170 students. 87% of the students are 90% or better in attendance, daily attendance. Um, there are 10% that are at risk between the 80 and 90% attendance and the 3% critical. So um, I did that for each, cla each class. Uh, eighth grade, 179 students, 89%. Very similar, actually they're all, all classes are in that 89, 87 to 89% of uh, a 90 to 95% or better. Uh, so that is a positive. Um, in the eighth grade, there's 10% at risk between the 80 and 90% daily attendance, and there's um, only two students out of the 179 that are at a critical. Now, the one thing that uh, we utilize is um, the program panorama for this, uh, and it doesn't take into account long-term sickness or hospitalizations or um, surgeries, things like that. It does not take those into account. So, so some of these individuals could be, when you break it down by individual student, it actually does a nice job of telling us which, you know, if it was an excused uh, absent over a course of a long period, um, those are excused. So th they wouldn't count t against us. Um, then ninth through 12th grade, uh, just to give you a 12th grade numbers, uh, which I'm a little concerned, and we're gonna have some class meetings next week to talk about attendance. Uh, 168 students, 82% are on track between 90 and over 95%, 90 or better. 4% uh, are critical, which are only six out of the 168 students. Um, the at-risk group is a little bigger than I, I'd like it to be. So we're really gonna focus, I, I've mentioned, we've already given the names to the guidance counselors. Uh, they're gonna stop pulling in the seniors to have conversations with them. Um, so it's 15% who are at risk. That's between the 80 and 90% daily attendance. You don't want to fall below that 90% because uh, then we have to look at credit recovery um, alternatives, um, you know, implementation for these students to make sure they, they get seat time back, basically is what, what we call it. Um, so that's 25 students. Our junior class, which I'm sure you'd like to know, um, we have 156 students in the class. 
88% or 90% or better. 4% uh, very similar are uh, critical, which are less than 80%, um, six students out of the 156, and only 8% are in that, that at risk, 80 to 90%. So overall, I was very happy when I ran the numbers and, and checked them and double checked them. Um, so I feel like you know, our attendance is on a better path from a year ago. Uh, I had limited information and data from last year, but I have found some as I'm looking through some files. So uh, it, it, it helps with um, knowing, okay, we're trending better. Last year, the average was about 92% daily attendance. So we're about two and a half percent or more better than a year ago. Uh, so we want to maintain, continue that. And this will help us with our interventions with uh, whichever, however we can intervention with, with our students. That, that's very important to us. Is there any insight as to how this, these numbers match up either regionally or statewide? Like where do we kind of fit into the big picture? I, through, through the um, Department of Education, I can look through their portal and look at past history of, of each district. So we could, we could kind of look at that. I am part of a lighthouse group, the South Shore Principals Group, um, and we are all starting to discuss the attendance because it's such a, a heavy burden now in the state. So uh, these numbers are starting to be um, you know, shared. Uh, which is really good. And, and I feel like I've connected with a few of our local, um, our neighboring schools, and, and I can call over to West Bridgewater, and, and, and he'll help me out, and, and, and Bridgewater Raynham, uh, she, she's done a great job helping me out with their numbers and stuff. Um, so uh, we do have a few community members, few, uh, families. Yet, but we're getting there. We're getting there, yeah. yep. So, but, but Desi puts out their, in their website, um, you can, it's public knowledge, so you can look what they have had in the past. They haven't done the current information because uh, SIMS comes out uh, October 1st and March 1st. So uh, that's where those numbers come from, okay. the SIMS report. Two and a half percent is a sizable jump. It's a pretty big jump. It is, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So was there anything that jumped out at you, like with subgroups that was unusual? Uh, I'm, I'm a little concerned with the senior groups. Uh, again, I think, I think um, the mindset, uh, when I broke down the students who are at risk or critical, right. um, I was kind of hoping when I looked at those students that there was maybe some ex ex excused absences. There are not many. So we are really going to focus on those individuals and, and, and see if we can game plan um, something that, that we can get that seat time back for those students. But nothing like students with disabilities or ELL students or anything like no, that? No, no, it wasn't, bro it wasn't, I didn't break it down in de that much detail, okay. to be honest, uh, but um, I was just looking at the numbers gotcha. uh, and, and that, I thought that would be pretty good. Right. Jeff, at what point are the parents made aware? Because I know you said you're going to talk to the seniors. Right. They're seniors, so they have to kind of own piece of that. But at what point are the parents brought in and told your child, you know, aside from a long-term illness or what have you, um, is critical or at risk? We, we've actually been sending out letters uh, once they re go past a fifth absence and also a tenth, a tenth absence. So we actually generate, School Brains generates a letter automatically. Okay. I've had their guidance counselors print those letters and mail them out. Uh, but individually also. Uh, and then anything over 15, we call them in, and we've had several meetings already. Okay. Um, and, and normally that generates doctor's notes, you know, you know some things that, that can help alleviate some of these absences. Um, it's, a, it's a nudge a little bit, I think, but um, we, anytime after the 15th absence, we really want to get the, the families in, the parents in, and the student to have a conversation saying, you know, you're already beyond the threshold of, you're below 90% at the 15th absence. Uh, and, and technically, credit, they wouldn't gain the credit to graduate. So uh, we really are focused right now on the seniors because it's a new system. Um, it's, it's uh, again, the weight of the state now, the demand of the state is, is a little different uh, for schools. And I think uh, we're just trying to shift that mindset for families. Um, and how is the... Um I know that when my boys are absent, I'll call them in, mm -hmm. but how is that line, like, do you have any information, for example, the seniors, like, you know, their parents may not be paying as much attention or what have you, because it's their senior year. Does, does the call-in system give you any data as far as, you know, parents, could that correlate to parents' awareness of their kids skipping school? It, 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 do, it does a little bit, but um, the state only identifies um, a medical, a long-term medical as an excused absence, bereavement is excused, mm -hmm. court is excused, and um, any type of military. Um, that those so those four categories are the only ones that, that technically the state recognizes. Um, 
we have a chance. We look at it also. We look at administrative. Um, we use <laughs> it's administrative discretion is the phrase I like to use. Is sometimes you know you, you have somebody who isn't necessarily they're out long term, but doesn't necessarily have the follow up, you know, or the support. Of course. So we have the discretion to to. Um, absolve those those absences but to the point for example if you have a student who's critical um, can you correlate to the fact is their parent calling them in or are they just skipping school you know like the call-in system that that bill will go through to right no I think the, the the I think the the critical students we, we when we look at them individually yeah. we have to go back <laughs> into our school brains and see okay have they been called out okay. and sometimes again it's it's having those students and their, their families and parents come in, and all of a sudden now you, they generate, we need the, oh, they were at the dog, please bring them in, because we need those to verify those absences. That's what we do. And so. what do you do? So in senior year, some students turn 18, do you still notify the parents? Yes, yes, yep. They're still under the school, mm -hmm. the school umbrella. Doesn't matter if they're 18. Uh, within school, they're still part, the right. parents are still um, their legal guardian, That's right. so. No problem. Uh, just a couple more things. Um, as uh, Superintendent Legault mentioned, Mr. Ferrioli, we're really excited about Mr. Ferrioli's classes and his students uh, helping out with uh, building up that trailer. Uh, I know he and his students are extremely excited to be able to work on that, and they're very upset that they can't go in there once it's all established. <laughs> um, this last week, we had uh, Dr. Melissa Winchell and Dr. Kevin McGowan uh, from Bridgewater State University come and do a training. Uh, at our faculty meeting for 90 minutes. Uh, and the training was uh, labeled as how to set your school on a path of anti-racism and non-bias. Uh, they were amazing. Um, they did a great job. Uh, they are part of that mock program uh, that Andrew mentioned. Um, and they did an amazing job where staff has now said, could they please come back for a PD? Uh, so that's something we'll look into uh, maybe uh, next year. But they, they did a really nice job of establishing um, the beginning conversation of, of, of really working with uh, students and faculty, working together uh, in, in, in trying to become a, a more diverse, a more aware uh, organization. So, um, and probably the most important thing outside of the report cards is tomorrow, if people are available, 4.30, our unified basketball team has its opening game at home. Uh, we are excited, they have worked hard can't wait 4:30. um abington abington they're ho we're hosting abington so uh it's a great take rival it is it is an excellent it is the most fun uh opportunity and i encourage as many people to come out and support uh this program so uh any questions the only thing i can say jeff is that the the communication is getting a lot better um talking with parents and um, I think you're doing a great job working with your parents working with your uh, faculty um, the communication is getting better from you to us and knowing what's happening I think the attendance as we talked about yesterday and today and um, those are the types of things that you said you wanted to look at you're staying on it you're seeing it and now you're now you're putting it into fruition you know you have some ideas for going into next year mm. so we'll see how that unfolds but it's nice to hear that you're working on that data and bringing it forward and Thank you. And, and continue to work on it with the teachers, with the, with the students. And Absolutely. It's good. This, um, Thank you. First deadline you have to ask, you're all, this is all you have to do all else. That's, as far as the, the two-year progress report, yeah, we just have to, we have to type that out and put it on the portal. Um, and we've actually, um, <laughs> we've contacted some schools who are, have done it in the past, in the last couple of years, and they've uh, sent over their files uh, for us to get, kind of give us a, a skeletal view of, of how to put it together. So, mm -hmm. Step by step, and I've recruited a really good team, and, and they're all working diligently and excited to help. So, but thank you very much again. Happy New Year! I'll, I will leave this. Thank you very much. Keep going. Just keep going. Seeing that we can hear it. Do you, do you want my microphone, Ellen? Mine's still no. on. Principal's <laughs> against me. I'm going to guess and say they can hear me. 
Um, so I'm going to go on to the action items. So the first action item is, and I'm talking a little bit louder just in case. Um, the first action that's required is the uh, idol. <laughs> so the people across the street can hear you. <laughs> um, at this time, I would take a motion to approve the school committee meeting minutes from December 17, 2019. So moved. Moved by Teresa. Second. Second by Tim. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. And I would take a motion to. I wasn't here. I shouldn't have seconded that. Okay, so we have one abstention. Well, you can second it. You just have to abstain from the vote. Um, and Gordon's not here. So. Um, okay, so we have, I would take a motion to approve the accounts payable warrant 25 SV dated uh, December 18, 2019, 27 SV dated January 1st of 2020, and 29 SV dated January 15th of 2020. So moved. Second. Moved by Teresa, second by Trista. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you, it was unanimous. And. Keep going. Don't worry about that. Don't worry. Don't worry. <laughs> uh, I would take a motion to approve a payroll warrant 26 PS dated December 23rd, 2019, and 28 PS dated January 8th of 2020. So moved. Second. Moved by Teresa, second by Tim. All in favor? Aye. 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 I would take a motion to approve to disband the high school building committee effective January 14th of 2020 and upon approval a letter will be sent to Susan Gilpatrick town clerk informing her that the high school building committee has been disbanded this building is this committee is no longer needed so moved we'll second by second by Trista this was the building committee that built yes, this, this building yep. yes. so and it's been moved. commissioned so you don't need it yep. anymore moved by Trista second by Trista all in favor aye, aye. aye. thank you it's unanimous and I would take a motion to approve to increase uh, the school crossing guards daily rate from $124.80 to $127.50 due to the increase of minimum wage. So moved. Moved by Teresa. Second. Second by who was that? Rob. Thank you. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Um, it's unanimous. And I would take a motion to approve disposal of work tables located at the Gordon W. Mitchell Middle uh, Mitchell School. So moved. Moved by Teresa. Second by Tim. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you, Mr. Unanimous. And um, I think at the beginning I forgot to mention thank you to Evie Kim for streaming our meeting and always recording us. Thank you. And I would take a motion to adjourn this meeting. So moved. Second. Moved by Teresa. Second by Tim. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Everybody put <laughs> <Unanimous>. <laughs>